Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We'd like to have you visitors visiting with us today. May the Lord bless you. You're always welcome here at Northside. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today, and I hope that it'll be a blessing to you. I want you to take your Bibles today and turn to Luke chapter 15. While you're turning there, I'd like to say just a word to the radio listen audience. If you're not getting our daily broadcast at 12 o'clock noon on the station where you're now listening, then you tune in to this station at 12 o'clock noon each day, Monday through Saturday, and you can get the daily broadcast, and I appreciate it if you would. Appreciate it if you tell others about it. A few weeks ago, we came back from the Holy Land. That was our trip number 10 to the Holy Land. I brought back with me some very beautiful Bible markers. These markers that have a beautiful flower on it. It says flowers of the Holy Land. And on the other side, they have scenes here. as Herod's Gate on this one, the New Gate, and Damascus Gate, Golden Gate, the Lion's Gate, and so forth. And these uh, Bible markers are very beautiful. I brought back a limited supply. And if you'd like to have one, if you're right in and enclose a gift to be used to help take care of the radio expense and request the marker, I'll get it right in the mail to you. Now, my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, Post Office Box 501, Athens, Georgia. The zip code is 30603. And I'd like to hear from you. This past week, I only received a very, very few letters in the mail, some three or four maybe. And I'm on this radio station by faith. I've been on it now in my 35th year by faith. And I depend upon God's people helping me keep the program on the air. But so many people take the broadcast for granted. They say, well, Preach Edwards has been on now for many, many years. He'll continue to be on now. I cannot remain on the radio by faith unless God's people stand by me, pray for me, and help take care of the expense. The radio bill cost me $139.20 a week to the station alone, and that's not counting the other expense involved in the radio ministry, such as envelopes and stamps and booklets and, and so forth. And I want you to pray for me, and if God lays it on your heart to stand by this home mission work, I believe it'd be a wise decision. Last week, the first of the week, I received a letter from a dear lady and said, Preacher Edwards, I once knew the Lord. I'd backslidden on God and said, when you came on on Sunday morning, I started to turn my radio off and something said, don't turn your radio off. I felt like I shouldn't. And so I listened to uh, the singing and the message and said, Preach Edwards, I came back to God. God got a hold of my heart and I came back to the Lord. I'm back in fellowship with God. Now that happened just a week or so ago. And you never know who's listening out in the radio listen audience. Plus the dear shut-in people, the aged people. We have members of this on, our own church here that are disabled to be here. Brother Wheelis and others are from time to time disabled to be in the house of God. And they look forward to this broadcast every Sunday. And I want you to pray with us and Ask God what it have you to do about helping keep the program on the air. When you only get about two or three letters a week sometimes, it makes it kind of rough to stay on the air by faith. It's not that way every week, but some weeks it is that way. And so I want you to pray for us. I know we have many, many listeners, and the program reaches out a long way, and I appreciate that. But, it, you know, we can get careless and unconcerned and neglect what we should do in response to this whole mission work. God gave the word, great is the company of those that publish it, and when we stand yonder at the judgment seat of Christ, God reward us together for all the good that's done through this radio ministry. Eternity alone will reveal it. Churches have been organized, there's missionaries on the field, there's men preaching the gospel, there's people living for God, directly and indirectly because of this radio broadcast when we went on there in 1948 and been on daily since that time. And so it's a worthy cause, not a fly-by-night ministry. It's established, well-known, and uh, you're wise when God lays on your heart 
to be obedient in supporting this whole mission work. I hope you'll find Luke 15. I will say this, we tape the Sunday morning broadcast every Sunday morning, music and message, and they're available on cassette tape. And we send these out if people are right in, request it, and close a gift of $5 or more to help take care of the radio expense and mailing expense and tape expense and so forth. Then we send the tape out to them at their request if they do so. So any tape that we have that we in any Sunday morning service we've had in the last couple of years or maybe even longer than that, we have them on tape and they're available. And once in a while I get a letter from someone say, Preach Edwards, I'd like to have a certain message. Maybe I preached it six months ago. I find the tape, I duplicate it and send them the tape on the me of the message. And so we do what we can to get out the gospel in these days. Preacher called me from Tennessee last week and said, Preach Edwards, I got a whole one of your tapes. And I want you to send me a list of some of your other tapes because I know they'll help me. I'm a young preacher getting started in the ministry and I need all the help I can get. And so I wrote him and gave him a list of some of our tapes and he'll probably be writing for some. So we're trying to get out the word of God in every way possible. We believe the time is short, time is running out. What we do, we must do it quickly. We're not going to carry anything with us when we leave this world. I've never seen an ambulance yet, a hearse rather, I've never seen a hearse going down the road to the cemetery with a U-Haul hooked behind it yet. Have you ever seen one like that? You're not going to take anything in the grave with you. You brought nothing in the world and you're not going to take anything out. And what you have, God's given it to you and blessed you with it. And you're wise every time you realize that and take care of God's business as you should. Now Luke chapter 15. Now last Sunday morning I began a message on some things we need to know about soul winning. I only got started in that message. I'm going to bring message number two today and conclude the message on the matter of soul winning. Now here in Luke chapter 15 we read last Sunday verses 1 through 10. We saw in verse 6, whenever the man found the lost sheep, he cometh home and call it together his friends and neighbors said unto them rejoice with me for I found my sheep which was lost there you have rejoicing we find in the next parable here that a woman had lost a piece of silver and she swept until she found it and when she found it then uh, she calls her neighbors together in verse 9 and tells them about it and they rejoice with her and in verse 10 it says likewise I say unto you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth and then in the third phase of this parable, you'll find it verses 11 through 24. You'll find there that the lost son came back home. And when he arrived back home, well, they had a real jubilee. They killed the fatted calf in verses 23 and 24. It says, bring him the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they criticized him because he ate with public and the sinners and won them to himself. And then he gives these parables. Now we saw last Sunday morning that soul winning, winning people to God should be first and foremost in our lives as a Christian. No doubt about that. God has saved you to do something for him. And one of the greatest efforts put forth is soul winning. Now you can win souls directly or indirectly. Well, you have a part in the work of God, whether it be your prayers, your presence, your gifts, or whatever it is, and the souls one to God, you have a part in that in the local church or in the uh, mission work or the radio ministry or whatnot. And so we saw then, secondly, that the fields are white on the harvest and the labors are few. There's never been a time when there's many people alive on the earth as in this hour. Now, if Jesus said the fields are white in his day, how about today? Did you know there's only been the seven billion people born on the earth since Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden? Seven billion. Did you know that more than four billion of those people are alive right now on the earth? The fields are white under harvest. Did it ever occur to you that just a very few of those people are saved and a very few of them will go to heaven? Jesus said, my flock is a little flock. Jesus says, narrow and straight is the way that leads to heaven. Only a few will be able to find it. And so the fields are white on the harvest, the labors are few. 
Now we move on today with thought number three, and that is the value that God puts on a soul. Now what is the real value God puts on a soul? Well, we see in the Bible by what he gave. Now what did God give? God gave his only begotten son, his precious son, the son of his bosom. God gave his son, and he died on Calvary for lost sinners. The Bible said Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. Then secondly, we see the value of a human soul by comparison. God gives us that comparison in Mark chapter 8 and verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? We have today in the world more millionaires than the world has ever known. We have many, many millionaires in the world today. But if they gain all the wealth in the world and go to hell, what have they gained? Their soul is more important than all the wealth they can accumulate. And so he said, now what would a man profit? What would be his gain if he gained the whole world and lost his soul? What he's saying here is that your soul is more valuable and more precious than all the wealth in the world. That's the way God compares it. And then it's by the price he paid. He tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, for as much as you know that you're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So the real price that was paid was paid through blood. God didn't buy your soul with silver. God did not purchase your soul with gold. He purchased your soul with the precious blood of his darling son, Jesus Christ. That's a price that God paid that you might not go to hell, that you might be saved. Now let's move on to thought number four. And that is what you accomplish when you win a soul to God. I want you to think about this for just a moment. Now before you can win, if you feed people on God's word and help them spiritually, you've got to win them to God. They must be saved. They must be made alive by the Spirit of God and Word of God. Now, what do you accomplish when you win somebody to God? Now, think about that. There's a lot of people today that's living for God that probably be in the penitentiary or sent to the electric chair or maybe broken in health or go to a premature grave had they not been won to God. Now, what do you accomplish when you win a soul to Jesus Christ? Let me illustrate this because it's fresh on my mind. Today I received a call from a dear lady in commerce and she said, uh, Preacher Edwards, I just want you to know my brother is now moved from North Carolina to commerce and he's living in commerce and he listens to you on Sunday morning and now listening to you every day. Well, a few months ago, I was called to go to the hospital here in Athens and this man was in the intensive care unit I would not give you 10 cents for his chance to live. I never believed the man would get well. Nobody else did. They just knew he was going to die. Now I began to work with that man, and that man came to know the Lord and began to revive and get stronger. And he's alive today, and he's probably listening to me right now. And his, his name is Buck Cheatham, old friend of mine of many years gone by. And I believe with all of my heart, had that man not gotten right with God, he might not be alive today. That's my own firm conviction. Now, what do you accomplish whenever you win somebody to God? That's an illustration right there. That's an example. His sisters, his loved ones, they're so glad he got saved. They're so glad he's still alive. What do you accomplish when you win people to God? Well, the Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 20, Let him know that he who is converted as a sinner from there of his way shall save a soul from death. So you see, when you win a soul to God, you're getting that soul from, saving that soul from going to hell. You win that soul to God, and if he's not one to God, he's going to uh, suffer the second death. God does the saving, but... God depends upon you to do the witnessing and to witness and help people come to know God. So you save a soul from hell. Now think about that. When you get to heaven and see the people that you have had a part in winning to Jesus Christ, they'll hug your neck, 
because you have win them to God and kept them out of hell. So when you win a soul to God, that means that person will not go to hell. Now that ought to challenge every one of us to win somebody to God. Not only that, but you cover a multitude of sins when you win somebody to God. Now there's a lot of people that's been very weak and that's been won to God. Had they gone on in their sins, they might have led their entire family to hell, but they got saved and their family came to God. Now there's been multitudes like that and because you got saved, no doubt somebody's been influenced by you that come to know God. You cover a multitude of sins. For instance, you go out here and win a bootlegger to God. He's been making moonshine and he's been selling it and people have been getting drunk and killed on the highways. And you win him to God, get him straightened out. Then he goes out helping others instead of selling his booze and getting people drunk. See, you cover a multitude of sins. You take the gambler, the cursor, the man that neglects his family. When you win him to God, he becomes a, a good citizen and a good father. And he cares for his family and loves his family. And that makes all the difference in the world. That's the fastest one time that one old drunk to God that beat up his wife and his children and mean to them. And they went hungry and neglected them. They did not have decent clothes to wear. And the whole family came to his tent meeting when he was running a meeting under a gospel tent. And the whole family got saved. And they appreciated so very much that preacher winning that daddy to God because he was a drunkard. He had neglected them. He failed to provide for them. They had gone liking for food and clothing and went barefooted in the winter time. And, and so they came to the preacher and told him how they appreciated him coming and bringing his tent. And how they appreciated uh, the daddy getting saved. Said all the difference in the world now. He had prayer with them. He read the Bible. He brought them to the meeting. He bought them some clothes. He bought groceries instead of buying whiskey. And so they just uh, thanked the preacher for it. And the little old boy wanted to give the preacher something. And he reached down the bib of his overhaul pocket. And he had two little round tobacco tags. He didn't have any money, but those little tobacco tags looked like a, a 25 cent piece. That's the closest thing he could get to money. But he wanted to give the preacher something. So he reached in the bib of his little overhaul pocket and tears running down his cheeks. And he took those two tobacco tags out and gave them that preacher. And he said, Mr. Preacher, he said, this is all I have. But I want to give these to you because my daddy got saved. And my daddy is a good man now. And we're so glad. That preacher stood there with tears in his eyes. He said, money couldn't buy those tobacco tags. He said, I still have them in my possession. And when the devil comes trying to discourage me, he said, I go and get those tobacco tags and I'll look at them. And I think about that old drunk that got saved. And I think about that little boy. And he said, I did. that gives me courage. I say, get behind me, Satan. I'm going to keep on keeping on. And so you hide a multitude of sins. There's many homes today that are in trouble. Many people with broken hearts. And many people are suffering today because of sin. Now, if you could get the head of the house saved, if you could get some member of that family saved, then God could get into that house and cover a multitude of sins. When you win somebody to Jesus Christ, some young boy gets saved. Maybe he's a potential drunkard, or a dope addict, or a robber, a murderer. And you get him saved, begins to live for God. And that makes all the difference in the world. Every one of us can be soul winners. Even children can be soul winners. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 6, a little child shall lead them. It's talking there about the millennium, but it is still true. A little child can lead people to God. Many years ago, I had my gospel tent erected in Greenville, South Carolina. A little boy, I believe the best of my memory, he was nine years old. He came to that tent meeting and he was gloriously saved in the early uh, nights of the meeting. And he came to me night after night and he said, Preacher, I want mom and daddy saved. I want them to go to heaven. I want them to know Jesus. I said, Son, just keep praying and inviting them to, to the tent meeting and maybe they'll come and get saved. He said, We're going to keep praying. Night after night, that little fella came and he kept praying for mother and daddy. I believe it was the last night of the meeting I saw him coming in. He had a big smile on his face and they had with him mother and dad. They had consented to come to the tent meeting. 
And so they came in and sat down. He sat right between them. He was so thrilled that his mother and daddy had come to that tent meeting. They were a young couple. He was only about nine years old, a little boy, the only child they had. And I preached, and he listened. He smiled. He prayed. His mother and daddy listened to what I had to say. And when I gave that invitation that night, that little boy looked up at mother, and he looked up at daddy as if to say, now's the time to go. You need to go get saved now. They couldn't stand back any longer. That little fellow came down that sawdust trail leading his mother and daddy, and they fell down on their knees and gave their hearts to God. The Bible said a little child shall lead them. No doubt some of you have been saved because your children got saved. Well, that happens many times. You can win souls to God even as a child. I could give you many experiences of how people have been won to God by a child. And then if you're aged, you don't get too old to win people to God. The Bible tells us that you bring forth fruit in old age. In Psalms chapter 92 and verse 14, they shall bring forth fruit in old age. Many years ago, during the days of Jess Henley's campaigns in Athens, when Jess Henley was such a great soul winner, preaching hell, fire, and damnation, taking a stand against modernism and evil, people were getting saved right and left. He had a tent erected here in Athens, and one night, two big, strong football players from the University of Georgia came to the tent meeting, and they sat in the back of the tent. And when Henley gave the invitation, uh, an old mother, gray-headed woman, stooped for very age, hobbled back toward the back of that tent and stood before those two big, old, strong, husky football players. And she said, young men, won't you go tonight and give your heart to Jesus? They said, oh, Ma, said, we don't want to be bothered about that. Said, going about your business, we're doing all right. With tears in her eyes, she pleaded. She said, boys, you need to go and get right with God. You need to get saved. A voice trembled, her body shook. She was very, very old, and she pleaded with those two boys. And they said, oh, Ma, we'll do it some other time. Just don't bother us tonight. And, and finally, she went on back to her seat. That night, when the boys went back to the dormitory, they were roommates. And they went to bed. And along about 1 o'clock in the morning, one said to the other, said, you haven't gone to sleep yet? So I haven't slept a week. How about you? So I haven't slept a week. Well, why aren't you going to sleep? Why haven't you gone to sleep? He said, you know, I just can't shake off that old woman coming back there and saying what she did in that service tonight. You know, the other said, the, the, the same thing is bothering me. I can't sleep either. So I can't get that old woman off my mind. Tears in her eyes, pleading with us to get right with God. Said, that old lady must be right. Said, I believe she's right about that. The other boy said, I agree. They said, what would be, when would be a better time than right now to get right with God? And they crawled out on their knees and repented and gave their hearts to God. And came back to the meeting and gave their testimony. That dear old gray-headed woman, God used her to win those big old strong football players to God. You don't get too old to be a soul winner. You can win souls and witness as long as you live upon the earth. You need to realize that. Then there's many means of soul winning. You may say, Preach Edwards, I want to win somebody to God. Could you give me some means whereby I could do it? Yes. The personal contact is one of the greatest ways to do personal soul winning. Now an insurance man, a businessman knows the value of a personal contact. Look at a man straight in the eyes and talking to that man. An insurance salesman knows if he can get a man to listen and he can sit down and look him in the face and talk to him about that insurance policy, he has a far better chance to win that man to God. He knows that, that personal contact. Now, businessmen know that. They know it's a good way to sell their product or win people over. Personal contact. Jesus believed it, that there's something about that personal contact. Taking a man by his hand, looking him in the eye, and talking to him about his soul. His weight is powerful. Jesus believed in it. Jesus talked to Nicodemus, a lone man, and told him he had to be born again or he couldn't go to heaven. Jesus talked to the woman at the well, a lone woman, and told her about the water of life. If she had drank that water, she'd live forever. Jesus talked to a little man up in a sycamore tree and told him, said, come down. Salvation day has come to your house, Zacchaeus. Jesus believed in personal soul winning. That's one way to win people. God, just sit down and talk to a man about his soul 
like you talk to him about his job, about his home, about anything else. Oh, you say, preach, I'm not good at talking to people. While well, you can sit down and talk to people about their dogs, their cats, their cattle, their farm, their jobs, their home, about politics, or ball games. You can sit there and talk about them all day long. And you can sit down and talk to somebody about Jesus if you really want to. God will help you and God will give you wisdom and you ought to do it. You'd be surprised how many people you can win to God. The first soul I ever won to Jesus Christ was through a personal contact. I was living in the city of Greenville, South Carolina. And they had trolleys in those days. You'd get on that trolley in town and ride out to where you live. And I was on the trolley coming out of town toward the uh, Judson uh, Mill village in that particular area. And I sat down beside a dear old man. He looked like he was troubled. I said to the old man, I said, sir, I'm saved. He said, well, you are. I said, yes, I'm, I got saved to you a while back. I said, have you ever been saved? He said, no, son, I, I've never been saved. I said, well, have you ever thought about getting saved? He said, yes, I've, I've thought about it. He said, sure have. And we talked on about that time the trolley stopped and the old man said, I have to get off here. Well, I thought my fish had got off the hook. He did shortly, but I got him back on again. But anyway... Jesus like and so when there's deficient, you know. And I watched that man. And I saw the house he went in right near the trolley line. He went into this little house. I knew where it was. I rode the trolley on home. I ran to my preacher's house. The pastor, I said, Pastor, I know a man that wants to be saved. And I believe if we'd go see him, he'd get saved. The preacher said, yes, we'll go. Where is he? I said, uh, I can show you. We got in the preacher's car and we rode over there. Went to the house, stopped in the yard, went up on the porch, knocked on the door. The dear old man came to the door. I said, remember me? He said, yes, I remember you. Talked to you a while ago on the trolley. I said, yes, that's right. I said, I want you to meet my preacher here. He said, y'all come in. And we went, he said, have a seat. We sat down. And I said to the, oh, the gentleman, I said, this is my pastor. And you told me on the trolley a while ago you wanted to be saved. He said, that's right. Tears came into his eyes. He said, I really do. And right there we led that man to God. That's the first person I ever knew of winning to God. Personally, the first one. Let me give you another experience. I was in the city of Greenville, South Carolina. My brother had married a young girl in Greenville. And they had come to Georgia to live. She was only about 16 years old. And she had given birth to a little son. And uh, she was seriously ill after the childbirth. And my mother and daddy wrote me a call. Me, he got in touch with me, and they said, uh, uh, "Said Ardell is is sick, is seriously sick." Said we want you to remember in prayer. I've only been saved a short while, and I couldn't get that off of my mind. Something kept saying to me, "You need to go see her. You need to go visit her." So I got off my job. My wife and I came over here to near Danielsville, where they lived at that time. And I walked in the house in my mother and dad's home. She is in the bedroom, lying on the bed. And I walked in and spoke to her and, and I talked with her just a moment. And I said to her, I said, Idell, wouldn't you like to get saved? She began to cry. She said, Virgil, I sure would. I want to get saved. So I'm sick and, and I, I want to get right with God and I want to be saved. I got on my knees and led that precious young girl to God. I went back to Greenville, I believe, the same day. The next day, they notified me that she'd gone on to be with the Lord. Yes, the other day over in the city of Greenville, they brought a body back to Greenville and buried it over there. We passed by the cemetery, and I told my wife, I said, that's where I there was buried. Sixteen-year-old mother gave birth to a little boy and went on to be with God. Now, what if I had not done that, done what God told me to do? God laid on my heart to drive all the way over here and witness to her, and I did, and God saved her. And because of that, she's in heaven today. My mother and dad took the little boy, raised him until he's two years old. He's playing one Sunday afternoon as healthy as any child you ever saw. That night he dropped dead just like that, two years old. See, you'll never know. If you obey God, then God will take care of the situation. He surely will. And that they, through the personal contact, some of the greatest preachers we've ever known have been people saved through personal contact. Dwight L. Moody. Robbed hell of over a million souls. And his Sunday school teacher paid him a visit to a bookstore, where, where his, a shoe store where he sold shoes. When he was a teenage boy and won him to God right there in that shoe store. And he went out and won over a million people to God. J. 
J. Harold Smith, the great evangelist, was won to God by his sister. Sitting on her porch one day, she said to him, said, Harold, said, uh, you, you've tried the world. You, you've tried everything the devil has to offer. So why don't you try God? Harold was a young man, about 21 years old. No sooner did she ask him to come to Jesus, he fell on his knees. Repented, gave his heart to God. God saved him. Two weeks later, he's preaching the gospel and never stopped since. He's won thousands, thousands, thousands of people to God. But his sister won him to Jesus right there on her porch through personal soul winning. I could go on and give you example after example. I know a woman, she one time lived in Athens. She got a husband to go to her tent meeting through a very wise way. She kept sending him to that tent meeting because he was critical of the preacher. He said, these preachers are just out to get money. If I were you, I'd go to the tent meeting and see how much money he got. So he went. And uh, next night he went again. And then uh, she said, now today's payday. He said, go again tonight. He said, if he's been getting money the last two nights, he said, they'll fill those pants tonight. He said, I, I believe they will. And he went back again just to see how much money the preacher got. That preacher put that old man's feet in the fire every night. Preached hell, fire, and damnation. On that third night when he gave the invitation, that old man came down the aisle and got right with God, and God saved him. He came back home. His wife heard him coming up the steps. About every other step, he was hitting it, headed toward the door. She knew something had happened. She said, well, how much money did he get? She said, well, he got a lot of it. He said, did, uh, but he said, he got me too. He said, Ma, don't we have $5? She said, yeah, we sure do. He said, I want, I want to give it to the preacher. He said, he got me tonight. She was wise in getting him under the influence of the gospel, and the gospel got him. It was nothing unusual to see that old man praying with somebody, witnessing somebody on the street, winning people to God. During days of ball games here in Athens, he'd give out tracts to the people coming in. He'd do everything he could. He'd go to the bus station, give out tracts, and get people to God. And he became a soul winner as long as he lived. His name was Mr. Pope. Many of you know him. On his deathbed, the old man said to his wife, he said, Honey, you hear what I hear? She said, no, what do you hear? He said, I hear some most beautiful music and singing I've ever heard in my life. Don't you hear that, Ma? She said, no, I don't. He said, it sure is beautiful. The old man closed his eyes, went on to be with God. Beloved, listen, you can be a soul winner. You can do it directly, indirectly. And you can do it uh, like Jesus said, be a fish of men. God wants us to do that. God wants us to win souls. We can win souls, and we should win souls to Jesus Christ. You know, I fully intended to have completed this message today, but I'm going to have to wait until next Sunday if Jesus tarries to complete this message. I don't want to leave any of it out. I want you to get it. Every one of us can be soul winners. God wants us to be soul winners, and we can win somebody to God. There's somebody somewhere. You can win to God. Now don't misunderstand me. Because you've never won anybody to Jesus personally doesn't mean you haven't won some souls. If you're a member of the Northside Baptist Church and you support this church with your prayers, your presence, and your finances, every soul that's saved in this church and every soul that's saved through our ministry and our mission work, you have a part in it. You've been winning souls indirectly. But there's nothing like winning somebody to Jesus personally. If you ever win one soul to God, then you're not going to be satisfied. It's like a lion getting a touch of blood. You're going to look for more. You want to win somebody to Jesus. God wants us to be soul winners. This is message number two on soul winning. Lord, only next Sunday I'll give you message number three and bring to a conclusion the three messages on winning people to God. I hope God will challenge your heart and stir you up to win somebody to Jesus. I'll tell you more ways Next Sunday, how it can be done. Let us all stand to our feet. <laughs> our Father, I pray today that you'll use this message. Stir hearts. Save somebody. May Jesus be glorified. God, may somebody become a soul winner today as a result of this message. We all can't be preachers. We all can't be teachers. We all don't have the ability to sing or make music like others. But, Father, we can be witnesses and soul winners and help us to do so, every one of us. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Debbie is going to play for us. And if you're in this building and you're unsaved, you want to get saved, come down here. We'll help you to God.
If you're backslidden, we'll help you back to the Lord. If you want to join the church, you may present yourself. If any other reason God has spoken to you, you want to come forward, you come while she plays a couple of stanzas. One of the greatest things you would ever do is win somebody to God. It's worth more than all the wealth in the world. anybody Jesus if you don't try you'll win everybody you try to win but you will will win some eventually get them to church let them hear the gospel you'll be credited for soul winning